and a volunteer can have me up there. Well, good morning, church. Good to see you. Y'all don't know it, but I went to church with y'all last week. I watched you on my phone. And y'all had a great time, didn't you? Michael preached a good sermon, and y'all had a great, a great time. We're in Romans chapter 6. There are some things, believers, that when you come to understand them, it will transform your life as a Christian. <clears throat> it will cause you to look at things differently. It will cause us to go back and re-examine some of the things we have believed. And so, the last Sunday that I was here, we, we talked about our, our mystical union with Christ. Don't remember what we said that was. It's mystical. <laughs> it's a mystery. It says that we are joined to Christ. And today we're going to look at something that's in that same category, and that is our position in Christ. You know what your position is at work. What is your position in Christ? Now, I came out of a tradition that we never talked about mystical union, that we're joined in Christ. We never talked about that we are in Christ and certain things are true of us because of that. We only talked about experience. We only thought about experience. We only lived for experience. We had very, very demonstrative services because, because we wanted to have an experience because our whole Christian life was bound up in experiences. How do I know I'm saved? I know I'm saved because I've got the Holy Ghost and I'm having experiences. If I'm not having any if I'm, if I'm not having experiences, then I'm afraid I'm not saved anymore. So Paul is going to take us into this. If this is brand new for you, just open up your minds and think. It's important or it wouldn't be here. Now in, this, in Romans chapter 6, Paul starts off, and here's what he's doing. We're going to, I've got a little, a little backtracking here because we're in the middle of an argument here that Paul's laying out. And he starts out in this chapter, his argument is he is answering objections he knows he's going to get because of his preaching about justification by faith. He knows people are going to come against him. Now listen, when Paul writes this letter, to Rome. He's writing this letter from Corinth. It's about 56 or 57 AD. So he's been traveling and preaching for about 20 years. People know his doctrines now. And some people think they are anathema. And so, verse 1, he, he begins immediately answering the objection. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase or abound? Now why does he ask the question? He asks the question rhetorically because he knows people are going to say what he preaches tells you that you can just live in sin, do anything you want to, and you're still going to heaven. That one saved, always saved stuff is an abomination. That's what the argument's about. It's ironic here 
that the people who believe that statement are the ones who come to this passage the most, even though they don't even realize it's refuting what they think. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Paul said, is this what we're saying? Then he answered in verse 2, May it never be, King James, God forbid, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? How shall we who died in Gaffney, who were buried in the cemetery, still be walking around Gaffney? How shall we who died to sin still be walking in, living in? Verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Let me read this again because this is where we were last two weeks ago, three weeks ago. What is this baptism? I, I told you, this can't be all water baptism because water baptism does not place us into Christ. Pictures these things, but it doesn't do these things. Baptists do not believe that baptism does anything salvific to give you water. We don't believe that baptism has anything to do with saving us. We believe in believers' baptism. We get baptized because we have been saved. But here he says in verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Listen, I make the point here because there are people who believe that this is only about water baptism and therefore if it's only about water baptism you are not saved apart from water baptism this is part of what the Protestant Reformation was about and Luther Luther is so tied to Paul because Luther discovered in the writings of Paul the doctrine of justification by faith and that was not what was being taught in the church of his day. And so they wanted to reform the church, and that didn't work because the church fought back. Then we had, we had what the Reformation became was a separation. So Paul is talking about spiritual baptism. We're talking about spiritual things. Here's what, here's what we're wading into. This is where I'm trying to take you today. There are things in the Christian faith you experience. There are things that you don't experience. You just learn that they are true of you. That's practice and position. It's the experiential side. Do we have experiences as Christians? We have experiences. But there is the experience side and there's the positional side where the Bible says this is true of you. You don't know it because you had an experience, but it's true of you because you had the experience. Listen, that, that's what regeneration and justification are. You don't experience justification. You experience new birth. New birth is where God gives us life. We come to life. We have spiritual life. We get spiritual understanding. The Bible is a closed book. Now we love it. We used to hate to go to church. Those goody, goody people. But now, now that we're one of them in Christ, we love this fellowship. That's something we experience. Justification is something you either know it's true or you don't. Which doesn't mean this church, the Christian faith, 
does demand that we think about some things and not just live on our feelings only. We have to think. So, this is what Paul says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Now, now listen. For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now, who's doing the baptizing here? A man? For by one, the, the Holy, the Spirit is the baptizer. For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, the body of Christ. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. So here Paul is saying, there is a spiritual baptism by which we are baptized into the body of Christ. Here's what happens when we're baptized into the body of Christ. Everything that's true of Christ becomes true of us because we are in Him. Now, get that. Because Paul speaks to tell us we died with Him. We were buried with Him. We rose with Him. How? Because God the Father counts us as being in Christ. Now, when you read your Bible, you're going to find that you run across in Christ over and over and over again. But me, we are in Christ. <coughs> now, I want you to notice that Paul's already been saying this about our relationship with Adam. How? How is it that we're lost because of Adam? It's because God counted us all as in Adam. In Romans 5, verse 12, Paul begins his long explanation and argument between this is what happens in Adam. This is what happens in Christ. He says in verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. How did we all sin? That's past tense, once for all. God counts us as in Adam, and when Adam sinned, he counted us all as sinners. Well, I don't like that. Tough. God did it. God says it, and he says it more than once. Doesn't he? That's a positional thing. God just reckoned us all as being in Adam, and Adam was the champion. When Adam fell, we all fell. What a fall it was. And when we fell with him, we got his sinful nature, which is producing sinful actions and brought chaos into the world. I didn't give y'all verse 19, did I? I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> Listen to this. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That's it. Adam was disobedient. He didn't just make himself a sinner. He made us all to be counted sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, talking about Jesus now, the many will be made righteous. We like that side, don't we? So they've been like, oh, I don't understand why, why I'm guilty with Adam. But you don't mind being righteous because one man, Christ, paid our, uh, all of our sin debt. Oh, now, that's okay. So, here's Paul answering the argument. Here's, because here's what he's saying. He's saying we're justified by faith. <coughs> he's saying that when we trust in Christ, that 
The righteousness of Christ is placed to our account. That's perfect righteousness. You can't get any more righteous than that. You've got it. And that is the righteousness that, that gets us into heaven, not our own goodness and good works. Try to picture Martin Luther, Catholic monk, <coughs> teaching theology in a seminary. He's had to learn the language of the Bible, and he reads these things. And first of all, this happened to him. He was born again. He was regenerated. The, he received life from God. And then he had understanding of spiritual faith. And as he studies the scripture, he sees the doctrine of justification by faith. He was in a church that was so works oriented that if you went to see your pastor priest and you told him that you had sinned, well, he would say, okay, I'm going to give you some things to do. You maybe say some Hail Marys, but then I'm going to give, I want you to go out here and pick up trash on the parking lot. I want you to go over here. I want you to spend some time visiting in there because you had to work to pay off your sins. Listen, justification by faith told Luther, that's crazy. We get the righteousness of Christ applied to us, and that's the way God sees us, and that's the way we're going to heaven. They also had this thing called purgatory. If you died, and, and you had made confession and, and, and got atonement for your sins, you had to go into purgatory and burn and be punished for maybe a year or a thousand years, or ten thousand years, or a million years, but you had to, until all your sins have been paid. Guess what? Justification by faith says we have the right, the perfect righteousness of Christ. If you have the per perfect righteousness of Christ, you have no sin debt at all when you die, and you're going to heaven like a purgatory. So, but, but what happened to Luther was within the religious community was great blowback, which is what's happening to Paul here. Great similarity between what happened to Luther and what happened with Paul. They, they, they both find the pure truth of the scriptures and then they have to fight the religious world the rest of their lives. What happened? But thank God they had the truth. Now, let's look at verse 3 and 4. For do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, spiritually baptized, into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Verse 4. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so as so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too are raised, and we might walk in newness of life. So we get his death, we get his burial, and we get his resurrection here. So we're in Christ. That means we shared. Are y'all with me? Don't get lost. Don't let your eyes glaze over. Your buddy's asleep poking. When Christ died, we shared in his death. How? We're in it. In.
Now let me show you. Let me show you something. We have died with Christ. That's not an experience. We don't experience that. But it's true. So here's the thing with salvation. We're going to experience some things. And then we're going to find out that other things are true. But I'll tell you this. When we understand the things that are true, it will affect our experience. Because we will see the glory of it and we can't hardly stand it. Let me tell you a story. I read a book one time about a guy. His name was Arthur. And uh, I loved it because it was kind of set from the 1890s into the 1916-17 period. But he was an orphan. In that thing, if you were an orphan, they had orphanages, and so he was put in an orphanage. And he was getting older, he was 10 or 11 years old, and it was, it was pretty well understood within the orphanage that when you got big, you, you never got picked because everybody's looking for a baby. They're looking for somebody new. So he had this buddy named Nick, and they would talk about the dad. And, and, and then in this case, when you were 16, they gave you some used clothes on your back and a little bit of spending money, and you were on your own. If nobody ever picked you. And so they're getting older. Uh, at one point in time, Mick, who's a little wild, talks to Arthur, and let's just run away. We'll go out here, we'll work, we'll do this. I know some people, and, and they got out and got beat up by gangs and all sorts of things. And, we're killing the seagulls to eat and crazy stuff because they're about to starve. And so I said, I'm going back. I'm going back to the home. Well, they go back and they go through a summer. And then one day, a couple walked into the orphanage. Their name was Shaughnessy. They were Irish. Bad. <laughs> they walked into the orphanage. And uh, they wanted a little, little boy. And for whatever reason, Mrs. Shaughnessy, they called her Beatty, she saw Arthur because he was drawn to him. So they got beside and they sat and they talked with him. And then they left and they contacted the orphanage and they told them, we, we want to take Arthur into our home to adopt him. So he told Arthur, and so on a day, he, he had everything he owned in a box about as big as my Bible. Much of it was he had a he had a butterfly collection. He'd go out and one thing he could do, he could collect it. And uh, he kept them all his life. He had this box. And they drive up in a motor car, an open motor car. Hardly anybody ever seen a car. This is where they have a car. And so they take him in his box and they put him in the car and they drive him to a five story home. And they bring him in the home. They walk him. He walks past a dining room that'll seat 50. They walk down a hall. There's an indoor bathroom. Not at the orphanage, you're out back. She says, Would you like to go in there and clean up? He goes in there, closes the door, he sees, he sees what it is, and he uses the bathroom, but now he's looking, he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> didn't fall, didn't, didn't leave. And so he finally opens the door and she says, here, pull a little, back in, pull a little chain and flushed. So listen, Offer is experiencing all sorts of things. 
He gets new clothes. He eats better food. He has his own room. He has a he has a father legally. He has a mother legally. He has a sister who are already in the home. But listen, these are things. Life is better. He's experiencing things. But listen, there's lots of things about him he needs to know, but he doesn't know yet. One is this. He's a legal son. And he has a vast inheritance. Because the reason, in, this is in Chicago, by the way, that, that his family lived in a five-story house is because his father owned a railroad. A railroad. And he also owned a million acres in Mexico. Cattle. When a meat packer, this is a true story. When a meat packer contacted the man, the former of that ranch, and said, Could you produce for us 30,000 cattle? He wired back, What color? <laughs> we got them black, we got them brown, we got them white face. What do you want? Big one. Now listen, so here, Oz begins to understand his position is changed. Not just his experiences, his position. Now he would go to the best schools. He would get educated. He would get prepared to be a part of this kind of a world because he was wealthy in his father. He was a beggar. He was an orphan. But now his inheritance is great. Now listen. He didn't experience that part. He just had to learn who his father was. He had to learn what his father could provide. Now, y'all, that's the way Christianity is. <coughs> New birth is an experience. Somewhere along the line, we, we have an experience where we come to know Christ. It doesn't always happen the same. Some, some of ours, it's all at once. Wow. I'm here lost and they're saved. For some people, it's more of, it, it's, it's more of a really felt pro, uh, progressive thing that goes on. You, you start getting understanding and you get more understanding. And somewhere you step over the line from I was dead and I'm alive. But that's an experience. We know that we know Christ by experience. Coming into the church. That's an experience. Having this fellowship together. That's an experience. It's a glorious experience. But this is all on a certain level. There's all this other stuff. That we don't experience. We just have to learn that it's true. Now listen. Do you think when often begin to understand what kind of a family had adopted him and brought him in? Do you, do you think that when he began to understand that, that that made him even more enjoy his life to realize what was out there for him? What's the way it is in Christianity? We have regeneration, which is synonymous to new birth. Regeneration is an experience. Sanctification to a degree. It's an experience. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. To bring us into holy living. Uh, it brings conviction when we sin. It's all, so, so this is something happening in us. When we sin, we're convicted, aren't we? So, I'll do that again. But listen, some things are not. And justification is not an experience. It's not an experience. You're, you'll never hear anybody say, oh, I, I remember the day I was justified. I was out picking green beans, and uh, it just hit me out in the garden. <gasps> justification. No, you don't do that. doesn't happen. Justification is something God says is true of you. 
When you come to faith in Christ, He says, you have been declared righteous. Period. It has nothing to do with how you live. This is why Paul's expecting blowback. Because here's what people say. Now wait a minute. If we just receive this righteousness and, and, and then whatever we do, it doesn't affect it. That's dangerous. It's better if we can tell people, if you sin, you're going to hell. And Paul is saying that is not true. We will serve God because we love Him way better than we'll serve Him if we're afraid of Him. Because God has done incredible things. He's loved us with an everlasting love. He's given us His Son. I have to be scared now? But, but the point here, Paul never backs up from this. Paul never backs up from the fact that we are justified by faith. We are declared righteous and that never changes. But now... He has, to, he has to lay out how this works. And so, we're in Christ. And the first thing is this. He says that we were baptized into His death. So we are, we are in Christ. And when He dies, we die too. Guess what? What's the penalty for sin? Death. Did we die? Mm. We died. Well, what other penalty for sin is there if we die? There isn't one, is it? Listen, that's why. I mean, that's why Paul says things like this over in, in, in Romans 8, verse 1. Listen, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is there no condemnation? We're in Christ. What's true of him is true of us. Is there condemnation for Christ? No. There's no condemnation, there's no condemnation for us here. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. It's gone for you. <coughs> it's gone. It's not hanging over your head. It's not hanging over you. <coughs> And then he says, in verse 4, Therefore, not only were we baptized into his death, therefore we have been buried with him. Let's see my that we're going we're to deal with burial. What does burial do? Burial is the evidence of death. Did y'all hear this? This was uh, within this year. I tried to look it up the other day, but a guy was in prison and they found him dead in his cell. Don't hear this. Anybody hear this? And three different doctors pronounced him dead. So they had him in a room. They were going to do an autopsy because they, he was in prison. They had to know why he died. And they're, and they're drawing the lines where they're going to cut, and he starts coughing. 
pronounced dead by three doctors. They're drawing lines. He started coughing. Guess what they deduced? They're doctors. These doctors said, I don't think he's dead. <laughs> he's coughing. And they started taking deep breaths. <gasps> and guess what? He wasn't dead. The good news is, because he wasn't dead, they didn't bury him. <laughs> Burial is the evidence of death. Jesus died and he was buried. And we were buried with him because that's the evidence that we died with him. <laughs> we have died with Christ. And then it says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into this, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Why? Because we've been raised with him. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus came into the realm of sin and death. He came and he lived in this realm of sin and death. There was no sin where he came from, was there? There was no death where he came from. He came into the realm of sin and death for us. He came into this realm of sin and death to get us out of the realm of sin and death. Understand this. You did not escape from sin. You were rescued. You were 100% rescued. Jesus came into the realm of sin and death in order to get us out. Here's the way the writer of Hebrews says in, in, in a 2 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. What does it mean? It means he lowered himself in his status in every way. He created the angel, but now he's made himself lower. Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So he comes into the realm of sin and death so that he can taste death for us. And here's how Paul says it in, in Galatians 4, 4 and following. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law. So he comes into the realm of sin and death, and he puts himself under the law. Guess what he does that no one else could ever do? He kept the law perfect in our place <coughs> so that he might verse 5 so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the <gasps> adoption as sons now you need to know that because you don't experience it you need to know who you are You need to know who your father is. You need to know what he has done for you. You need to know what he has in store for you. It has a lot to do with how you live your life and practice what you know up here. Who wants to fail a God like this? Let me read verse 5 again because it goes to verse 6. 
so that we might redeem those, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, because you are sons. <laughs> because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That's an experience. The Spirit baptizes us into the body and we drink of that same Spirit. Woo. This is something we're going to shout about. The people that shout the most don't even know what they've got to shout about. We know. We restrain ourselves. Maybe, maybe too much. But this is what. Let me read verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. We were slaves in sin. But a son, and if a son, then an heir. An heir through God. Me and Donna have talked about our inheritance. You know how things work out in life. I mean, things change and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, when, when Donna's mama died, she had talked to her mother for years about one, let me get it too big, about this high off this, about this long, a little table. She wanted it. And if I remember right, when her mama died, Somebody got the house, not Tom. And when Don was trying to get her a little table, I guess it was the person who got the house. That, or that's not the one, as if she didn't know what table she'd been talking about for years. But anyway, that's her here. She got it. We get a house, got the little table. Uh, and uh, when my mom died, I, I got a, I got some stuff that boxed up. I was here when my mom died. It was 2007. It seemed like I just got here, but it was December the 18th of 07. I got a call. My mom died. My sister went there. She had uh, sold her house. She moved into, wasn't an assisted living place, but the place for seniors. We had, you had your apartments together and stuff. And, and uh, so we packed up her stuff, and she had a big old wooden pump organ and one of my brother. I had no place to put it. I got a little set of silver. It's it down in the basement. And uh, some pictures. Maybe a little bit of her jewelry. Stuff like that. But I could put it all in a box about like this. <laughs> and that's just true for a lot of us. Isn't it? We, don't, we don't get a lot handed down to us. My, my father got my grandfather's ranch and, and uh, my grandmother lived uh, up until gosh, 1995 or something. But anyway, he started selling off a piece here and a piece there. He never wanted, for some reason, he was the total opposite to me. He never wanted to be on the ranch. He never wanted to be out in the country. He always wanted to be. Maybe he went to World War II and came back and he had seen Curry and you know, we're ranked. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But as soon as all gone, we found out when my, when my brother died and went to this funeral back in, we buried him back in the cemetery where my grandparents were buried. We found out that day that he sold it. But uh, I'm a believer. Who cares? Who cares? I am an I has not seen, ear has not hurt, it has not entered in the hearts of men. The things that God has prepared for those who love Him were heirs of God. Can I get a hallelujah?
Let me give you one more, and we'll go. And that is, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might walk in newness of life. And listen, we are raised with Christ. We're in him. What happened to him after he was raised? Then what happens? He's here 40 days. Oh, he ascended. Listen, Jesus came into the realm of sin and death to get us out. You know what he did? He got us out. You know where we are? When we're in Christ, when he rose, we are in him. We rose with him. He's in heaven. So are you. You say that's impossible. <coughs> Listen to Paul. You, you don't believe me? You believe Paul? <laughs> Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are not here, you're there. You just think you're here. Now listen, this, this gets us into this thing about position and practice. Yes, we're here. Yes, we still struggle. Yes, we still have a sinful nature. But we are righteous in Christ. But here's what you need to know. God the Father sees you already in heaven glorified. And he's never seen anything that wasn't true. You understand me? God the Father sees you already as in heaven and glorified, and He's never wrong. That's where you are, and that's where you will be. Listen, we've already left. We just haven't caught up with ourselves. We died with Christ. We're still here. But we died with Him. That's what God says is true of us. We were buried with Him. We're still here. But we were buried with Him. Proof that we died with Him. And he was raised from the dead, and we are raised in him. We have a new life. It, it, it means this for us. Listen. We are no longer captive to the realm of sin and death. We have been set. We do not have to live in slavery to sin now. Why? Because we have conquered the realm. We still have to struggle because we're still here. There are feet on this ground that we've conquered. And you have already conquered death. You rose from the dead with Christ. Death has no hold on you. Do you understand me? Death has no hold on you believers. 
Here's all, listen, here's the only thing lacking. Here's the only thing that has to happen. We have to exchange this body for the new one, and that's it. That's it. Everything's in place. Everything is ready. Everything is true. We're going to exchange this body for the new body, and it's over. And we're physically present with Christ in the presence of the Father for eternity. This is all true if we know Christ now, if we have trusted Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I just pray. I know, I know we sometimes struggle to understand deep things, these are deep things. But I just pray you will let your people be able to relish the glory that is ours. To see at least a glimpse of what all this means for us. To glory in the fact that we are in Christ. And for those who maybe are just struggling to come to understanding, I pray, help them today. By your Holy Spirit, take your word and make it plain. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So.